Um, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Brandi Howdy. I work in the CalPAS Operations Office here at the CDE. Um, also co-presenting with me today is uh, Nathaniel Holmes. Nate, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm here, and um, I'm a trainer here at CSIS. I provide uh, assistance with CalPADS technically, so I'm joining Brandy and Shiloh today and presenting uh, for you all. Perfect. And actually, um, joining us also today in the room is uh, the administrator of the um, NPS unit. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm the acting administrator of the NPS unit, Teresa Costa Johansson. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here today. Okay, so the purpose for um, the collection of discipline and incident information in CalPADS um, is to provide suspension and expulsion information to satisfy ESSA requirements. Um, there are two collections within ESSA. One is the Persistently Dangerous School data collection. Um, and the other one is something called the Uniform Management Information Reporting System. Um, so years ago, we used to collect uh, what we called UMERS information back in something called the Consolidated Application, which was years and years and years ago. All of that information now is collected through CalPADS to meet these federal reporting requirements. Um, the other reason that we collect suspension, um, expulsion, and then starting this year in 2019-20, restraint and seclusion information um, per AB 2657 is to meet federal reporting and state reporting um, for IDEA and then obviously the um, state reporting requirements that were implemented this year for AB 2657 specific to restraint and seclusion. So the data that are required for uh, to, to fulfill all of these reporting requirements are um, local educational agencies are required to report any incident occurring in the academic year between July 1st and June 30th um, involving violations of Education Code sections 48900 and 48915, even if those uh, violations did not result in suspension or expulsion. So even if they resulted in other means of correction, LEAs are required um, to report it to the California Department of Education. Additionally, because of AB 2657, now LEAs will also have to report any incidents resulting in the use of behavioral restraints um, and seclusion, even if they were not a result of a violation of Education Code sections 48900 and 48915. Um, specific to the legislation on restraint and seclusion, uh, you should refer to Education Code section 49005.1. Um, additionally, we have a series of communications, because I know this is directed towards non-public schools. Um, we have a series of communications called the CalPAD Cal Flash messages. Um, and we will show you a little later how to get to the CalPAD Flash messages. Um, and they're communications that we send out from the CalPAD office on a regular basis um, related to all the data collected in CalPAD. Uh, Flash 159 has a complete summary of the purpose for restructuring our discipline file and all of the required data in, in this new file restructuring, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So there was a change in the defiance law, um, and this does pertain to any student that does attend a non-public, non-sectarian certified school. Um, so the current law prohibits local educational agencies from suspending any student in grade K through 3 solely for, for committing um, an ed code violation of defiance or disruption. So that's the only thing they did. Um, you are prohibited by law from suspending any student in kindergarten to third grade solely for that. Um, additionally, you cannot expel kids in any grade, K through 12, for solely defiance and disruption. Um, beginning in July, uh, July 1st of 2020, um, that law is being expanded to grades 5 through 8. So, um, so it, it's actually K-8 cannot be suspended solely for defiance and disruption. Um, and then it is also applicable to charter schools. So 
So the expectation is that all local educational agencies will submit these data and certify them as part of our end of year three submission. Um, the end of year three submission, uh, the student incident data is one piece of the end of year three submission. Um, but local educational agencies, and for that matter, non-public, non-sectarian certified schools, NPS schools, should already be collecting this information in their local data systems in preparation for submission to CalPAD. Uh, we are making changes to the file layouts and things like that. So normally, in a regular reporting year, um, local educational agencies could theoretically be submitting up these files to CalPADS right now. Um, but because we made changes to those file specifications, very likely LEAs will not begin to submit these data up to CalPADS until the May time frame. Um, so non-public, non-sectarian schools are expected to track incident data for all students that are referred by their district of residence. Um, the NPS then is expected to report those data, all of the incident data, back to that district of residence so that district of residence can report the data to meet federal reporting requirements. Okay. Um, it is really important that not only local educational agencies, but non-public, non-sectarian schools additionally have uh, policies and procedures in place to uh, identify, document, and report incidents of restraint and seclusion for students with disabilities. So um, it is really important that all of the staff um, that would be involved in the identification, documentation, and reporting of these incidents, that they're properly trained on how to do that. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today, um, ways that you can track it, specifically if you don't have um, a formal student information system. I, the last time that uh, I believe we held this webinar, we found out that, that many of the NPS schools actually track this information like on spreadsheets, right? Um, so we're going to give you some tips on how you can start tracking that information so that it's consistent with the way the data need to be reported to CalPAD. Um, the other thing is that data administrators, so that the people that are entering the information into the student information system, whether it be at an NPS school or at a district, um, should not be the individuals that are determining what discipline records are reportable incidents. Okay, that is really a site administrator responsibility, meaning um, did this student violate ed code? Okay, it should not be up to a data technician or a clerk to figure out whether or not a student violated a particular education code. Uh, that responsibility should be solely on site administrators. Additionally, the appropriate result of that any sort of incident, so if a student is suspended in school or out of school, is ultimately expelled um, or restrained, those types of things, uh, particularly any sort of disciplinary action, should be the responsibility of site administrators as well. It's okay, so just to go over some terminology. So what is an incident? What are you reporting exactly? So an incident is an event resulting in the use of physical or mechanical restraint or seclusion. Um, and it does not necessarily have to be related to a statutory offense. But then you're also um, reporting incidents that involve statutory offenses, even if that uh, statutory offense did not result in suspension or expulsion, right? even if it was other means of correction. Um, an incident can be an event that involves one or more students committing one or more offenses um, that ultimately ends up in one or more results for each of the students within the incident. The incident result is the outcome, right? So if, if a student uh, brandished a knife at school uh, and, the, and the student received out-of-school suspension for 10 days, um, that out-of-school suspension would be the outcome, or in this case, the incident result for that particular incident for that particular student. When we, when we talk about statutory offenses, um, Education Codes 48900 and 48915 are sections of the Ed Code that outline offenses for which a student in California can be suspended or expelled. Okay? 
if, if offenses fall outside of Education Codes 48900 or 48915, you cannot suspend or expel students. The only expellable or suspendable offenses are all listed in 48900 and 48915. Um, with respect to the definitions for uh, behavioral restraint, so that's mechanical restraint, physical restraint, and seclusion, AB 2657, um, and I believe the Ed Code was on the previous slide, so it's 49001, 5.1, 49005.1. Um, those definitions can actually be found in that law. So we would strongly urge you to uh, read the law um, with respect to these definitions. You will notice that in some cases they're a little bit vague, um, and that's purposeful because the intent is that local educational agencies and non-public, non-sectarian certified schools will develop policies on what an incident of seclusion or what an incident of uh, mechanical or physical restraint are based on that education code section and, the, and based on the law. Okay, so Nate is going to walk you through a few different scenarios and, and, and the types of data that you would submit into CalPAT. Okay. And so I think I'm sharing now. Um, if we focus our attention on scenario one, um, we can see that we have the incident, the big red uh, bubble in the middle, right? And so this is conceptual. We're trying to show you uh, various ways an incident would be reported in the different elements that you would have, right? So you're going to have an incident. Something happens at the school. And uh, scenario one, you have a single student incident, right? And within that, there is going to be the results of the incident. That's the disciplinary action. Um, this particular student committed multiple offenses. You can see offense one and offense two. That could be any number of things. It could be uh, defiance for not telling, uh, following instruction to reveal what was in the backpack. When they finally find out what's in the backpack, it can be uh, tobacco, right, or uh, cigarettes or uh, whatever kids are using nowadays, right? And so you can have two offenses and a single result. That result could be suspension or what have you. So that's scenario one, right? Scenario two, we have a student and a result. Notice that the incident is recording this, but there is no uh, offense committed, right? And so not every incident has an offense, right? Or a statutory offense. Um, this could be the example uh, when uh, we're talking about seclusion or restraints. The student. Um, needed to be uh, restrained because they were a threat to themselves, right? There's no no harm, no violence, no threat to anyone else. It's not a, a violation of Ed Code 48900 or 48915. And so in, th in that instance, you would be noting the use of uh, restraint in the result. Um, in scenario three, we have a student who commits a single offense and a single result. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, that could be any number of things. That can be harassment, um, threatening another student, and uh, the consequences of, of that. Um, then we have a scenario four where we have two students that are tied to one incident. So we have student one and student two. Uh, student one has two results in a single offense. And so perhaps what student one did was uh, so heinous that they were not only suspended, they were they had an in-school suspension as well. So they serve three days in school and five days out of school suspension. Um, student number two in scenario four has a single result but two offenses. So maybe this student um, was somehow complicit with the offense of student one and then committed another offense of their own. Uh, whatever they did maybe wasn't as severe as student uh, one, so they had a single result. Maybe that's just the in-school suspension. Uh, so there's multiple ways that, uh, that incidents can be recorded and reported. And so when you're uh, gathering data for the incident, you want to make sure that you can provide the LEA with all the elements they need to report it to CalPATS. And so that would include uh, things like the incident date, when it occurred, the students that were involved, the student offense, right? Um, 
Those can be found in the code set and the document that we're going to provide for you that we'll talk about later uh, that are mapped. Uh, and then the incident result, what happened, what was the result? And included in that is uh, could be who determined the result, which was the authority. So we'll talk about those elements a little bit more very shortly. All right, and so the student discipline file, if you uh, reported last year, and last year was the first time I remember it being required of MPS schools, uh, it was a single file type. We provided you with the template, and we asked that you uh, populate information in the template and provide it to your LEA. Well, uh, because we are now uh, reporting incidents that don't necessarily involve require offenses, uh, that single file type was broken down, right? And so now we have three elements that will be used to report student discipline. And so uh, you at the NPS school will be required to provide information uh, about the incident, and that will be used to uh, populate a student incident file. We call it a sync file. Uh, we want to know the results of those incidents, right? And so that's going to be a student incident results file that's the SIRS. And then for any student that commits uh, offense, uh, that's mapped in ed code 48900 or 48915, uh, the student offense file, and that's the soft file, right? So those three file types are going to be used to collect student discipline. Um, every incident, every sync file will always have a result, right? If you have an incident, we need to know the result. Uh, some will also have student offenses associated to the incident as well. And so uh, the so we'll just recap what uh, the, the restructuring will do for us. It allows multiple incidents to be reported for a student within a single incident. So previously, we only needed the final disciplinary action. That's no longer true. Every incident result should be reported. Uh, the, uh, and it, it could be one incident. It could be a single offense. But if there's multiple results, those are individual records, and they'll be tied to an incident. And it also allows for the reporting of incidents unrelated to statutory offenses. So again, uh, any offense that should be reported that's not a statutory offense would be one that involves seclusion or restraint. And so the key points are uh, we want to collect information for all incidents that include seclusion or restraint or uh, offense that's in ed code for 8900 and 48915 so you've heard that several times already um, in which statutory offense was committed and or seclusion or restraint right so those are the key points um, and you'll provide information in support of that and so again the three different file types right we have the sync file that would be the incident that's the one that you're going to submit first uh, you're going to outline the elements that tell us, uh, you know, what's the incident number. Uh, it will what what school or what what where it happened at. You know, I guess if you're a single MPS school, you won't have multiple schools to consider. And then that that file mainly is used to tie the results and the offenses, right? And so every incident file has a results file. So that's why we have that in the center of the screen. Second, that will typically be submitted. Uh, for every incident, um, you're going to have a, a result, and that student could have more than one result, even though a single incident or a single offense. And then any offenses committed uh, and noted in the incident file, and there's a column in the sync file that says, did the student commit a statutory offense or not? Anytime you indicate yes, you're going to be expected to uh, provide the student offense information, and that should be tied using the incident ID, which we will explain shortly. And just at, so you can understand the record relationship. So I don't know if there's any LEA data coordinators on the call. You know, the intention was to provide information for NPS schools, but the LEA data coordinators, we definitely need a enrollment, right? So the SCNR, the student, must attend the NPS school in CalPAS. That, there should be a record of that. Um, and then where the incident happened, right, the, the you're going to use the uh, 002 code if you're the LA data coordinator in the sync file. And then you're going to use the student's SSID, the incident ID, the school of attendance, and the academic year to associate student offenses from the soft file or student incident results from the SERS file. And so this is 
conceptual for the LEA data coordinator. Uh, if you're an MPS school, what's uh, relevant to you is, again, you're going to need the information for the three different file types, the sync, the soft, and the SIRS. Okay, uh, Nate, this is Shiloh. So I just wanted to just pause for a quick second because we're getting a few questions and I want to address them before we get too much further along. So some people are, somebody is asking about restraints and seclusions that occur in a residential treatment, like in the residential part of a NPS um, that has a residential select section. So, um, you know, we're going to go, that's a good FAQ that we're going to kind of work on a little bit more. Um, I know that's come up before, and so we'll kind of work on that piece of it. Um, I'm going to tell you, if you're thinking about the, the spirit of the law, right, so why do we want to collect this kind of data? We want to ensure that students are in environments where they feel safe, where they feel supported, and when you have excessive levels of, of restraint and seclusion, that can undermine that, and that's what we've seen in a lot of our more public incidences. So I just want folks to understand um, that you may be at a better place if you just err on the side of caution for now, but we are working to try and come up with an FAQ specifically on that. Um, somebody was asking defining what an in-school suspension looks like. So thinking about any school, um, regardless of if it's a non-public school or not, um, there's some key elements around FAPE and the LRE, a free and appropriate public education in a least restrictive environment. So if we've defined an NPS, what does the day-to-day -day LRE look like for that student? And if you are, for disciplinary reasons, removing them um, and putting them in another classroom, another setting, you're giving, you know, because you're trying to discipline them, that's an in-school suspension. So you wouldn't, there's not a lot of, oh, we're going to send you home, maybe in an NPS, especially if it's residential. It's where you're, the student is experiencing the, um, the suspension away from class, away from um, peers, into uh, because of a disciplinary reason. Um, the uh, I'm just trying to kind of quickly, if there was no offense, what would be marked in the offense section of reporting? So if you're reporting a restraint or a seclusion, there would be no offense. So you wouldn't fill out that section. And we're going to we're going to kind of walk through that um, in some different scenarios in, in just a few minutes. Um, and then so they said, I wanted to confirm, non-public schools provide the information to the LEA, and the LEA is responsible for submission of the report. That is correct. So the students, for students that are served in an NPS, the, LEA, the NPS has to report that data back to their LEA. But the reason that we're doing this training primarily is to give you an understanding of the exact format that's going to be needed. Every single file that we're going to show you here today, um, the local educational agency needs those key pieces of information in order to actually submit the data both into their student information system and, and subsequently to CalPAS. So it's really important that you provide them with all of this information um, so that they can report it uh, appropriately. So again, I think there's just a lot, couple of questions that are coming through that are just confusing. So what do we want folks to report? We want to re folks to report incidences that were either violations of 48900 and 48915 and or um, resulted in restraint seclusion, right? So you have, so you could have a student who has a violation of 48900 that experiences a restraint or seclusion, you would report that. You can have students who, who do not experience a violation of 48900 or 48915 but experience a restraint and seclusion, that would still need to be reported. So, um, so the, the offenses are not required unless a violation has occurred. Um, so kind of keeping that in mind. Um, and uh, okay, um, we're going to keep going on. I'm going. I know that there's still a few more questions in the chat, um, but we. I want to keep on moving, and then we'll come back to them. Go ahead, Nate. Okay. Thank you, Shiloh and Brandy. Um, let's see here. This is uh, Brandy's wheelhouse right here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so what you're going to see here is the first of our three files. The student incident file um, has a baseline set of information um, that captures some really high-level information. Uh, what we want to stress to you is that the key components for this particular file are the columns that Nate actually has uh, or put data into in this in this particular file. So you'll see the record type code. 
Um, this is just a standard code. SINC is the student incident file. And so um, even if you do not fill this field out, your, uh, the CalPATH administrators at your local educational agencies, um, that's something that they can take care of. The local record ID. Um, it's probably preferred, uh, but not necessarily required from non-public schools. Um, again, because your local educational agencies are going to be taking this information and putting it into their student information systems, a lot of that will change. But it's just a way for you locally at the NPS to keep track of, let's say, a specific record in an Excel spreadsheet. What, what line is it, for example? Um, the reporting LEA, that's a representation of that student's district of residence or their district of special education accountability. Okay, so it's their seven-digit county district code. Um, in CalPADS, the school of attendance, in this case, um, for NPS schools is a generic code of 00000001. Okay, but because you as an NPS will be filling this particular form out, what you uh, want to make sure you let the LEA know is what the seven-digit school code of your actual NPS school is. Um, you may, it's preferred that you don't fill it out in that particular field, um, but you definitely want to let your LEA administrator know which NPS school you're submitting data for. The academic year ID will always be the academic year of the year that we're reporting in, and it's currently the 2019-20 academic year. Okay, um, some of the really, really key components here are the first and last name, Obviously, you want to also fill in the student's birth date and gender. This helps the LEA to identify that particular student. The last five columns have been bolded for a reason. These are the really key fields um, that you need to keep track of. The first is the incident ID local. Okay, so let me be clear. All NPS schools should develop a method within an academic year to track incidents by a unique identifier, okay? It's unique to your NPS school. So the example that I've given you here today, so we're, um, and, and this is just an example. You don't have to use this particular convention. It's just an idea. You may actually use an auto number that's assigned by a database, for example. Um, but what you want to do is you want to have a way to uniquely identify the incident, okay? Remember, an incident is an event that happens on a specific date. And that incident could involve multiple students. So in this case, you'll see that this incident one, we've given uh, an identifier of 2019-001, because it happens to be the very first incident of the 2019-20 school year. Okay? And you'll also notice that there are two students that are involved in this particular incident. What may also um, be of interest to you is that if you look at the reporting LEA for these two students, they're from different reporting LEAs, okay? So they, they can be from different districts of residence. They were both involved in this same incident. The incident happened for both of these students on the same day because they were both involved in the uh, same incident. The incident occurrence date. Um, this is not the date that a disciplinary action was administered. This is the date that the incident occurred. The next column, statutory offense indicator. This is an indication, yes or no, of whether or not this particular student violated one of the ed codes, which is 48900 or 48915. In this incident, both students committed violations of education codes 48900 or 48915. Um, was student instructional support provided um, during after the result of this incident. So in this case, let's just hypothetically say the students were suspended for, for 10 days or more. Um, instructional support is required to be provided after a period of suspension of 10 days. Um, and in this case, instructional support, um, and instructional support specifically means that the student um, is receiving the services provided to them in their, per their IEP, okay? That's what instructional support means. Instructional support does not mean you sent the kid home with a homework packet. That is not what it means. <laughs> um, 
And then finally, a removal to interim alternative setting reason code. Um, so those of you in the NPS world and in the special education world know these as 45-day placements. So if this student was removed from their regular educational setting for a temporary period of no more than uh, 45 days and was placed in another setting um, because uh, they were uh, a risk to harm themselves or others, then that's a removal to an interim alternative setting or a 45-day placement. Um, and then you would have to tell us the reason that the student was removed to that alternative setting if it, in fact, happened. Okay. Um, so you'll also notice um, that there's another incident here. So for incident two, we've assigned them a different incident ID local. These two students were involved in the same incident. Again, they're from two different reporting LEAs. Um, now, what's really important to understand is when you provide data back to the reporting LEA, um, you could provide reporting LEA 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, an incident for a pseudo-student with 2019-001, and then you would provide an additional file to reporting LEA 2345678, that same incident ID. So remember, you're reporting that same incident ID to two different reporting LEAs because the students belong to two different reporting LEAs. Okay, so I just want to go to a couple of questions. Um, people are still asking about offenses that are occurring in the residential part. Um, we are going to work on an FAQ um, around this issue. It's come up before, um, and so sort of be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, I would, in terms of, I would always think about the spirit of the law, which is why we want to ensure that students are feeling like they are in a supportive environment, and if um, they're experiencing a lot of restraint and seclusion, you know, it's something you may want to track. So I would always err on the side of caution now, um, and then potentially determine later if you want to, um, if you need to report it based on our FAQs. Um, somebody was asking, well, do I need to apply these file types and things like that to um, students ages three to five? If you have students ages three to five, um, and they are experiencing, somebody said ages 0 to 5. Um, so right now we are covering really ages 3 through 22. But if you have children who are experiencing restraint, seclusion, suspension, or expulsion, um, and they are ages 3 to 5, you are required by law to report it. So this is, it applies for them as well. So these are students with disabilities. Uh, children with disabilities, ages 3 to 5, IDEA covers that as well. So kind of clarify. Um, so I think that's all we have right now. Okay. Um, and also, for those of you um, that, that were not aware, uh, Marshall did post a link in, um, I believe, the answered. It was one of the very first posts. If you go to the Q&A and you go to answered, um, you'll see a link to the resources where you can find a copy of this PowerPoint. Okay, so moving on. The next file is the student incident results file. Okay. The student incident results file has some other key fields. So for every incident, for every student, one student could have one or more results for a particular incident. Okay. So every single student will have results, every single student. So you will have to submit the student incident and student incident results file for every single student who, um, for whom you report an incident. Now you'll see again here some of our key fields. Uh, they're very, very similar to the other ones. Um, you'll notice that the incident ID is also on the student incident results file. That is super important. That incident ID connects all of these files. Okay? So you'll see that same incident ID, 2019-001, for pseudo-student and phony pupil. But now we've got another series of data elements that we're capturing here. So the first is the incident result code. Okay, this is the outcome of the incident. Okay, uh, we're going to walk you through a spreadsheet and just. Uh, do you think we should do that now, Nate, or um, should we wait till a little further after we get through this section? I think uh, I think going through the uh, 
this section in, in whole is good and then uh, hammering it into their mind with the, uh, the document. Okay, um, so the next is the student incident result code. So again, the incident result is uh, suspension, in-school suspension, uh, other means of correction. It could have been um, restraint, seclusion. Okay, so a student can have one or more results for one incident. The incident result authority code is the authority that um, issued the incident result. So for example, if, was it school personnel? Did the principal say this student was suspended? Uh, was it a local governing board that, that issued the suspension? Was it a court or hearing officer that um, gave the student their discipl disciplinary action? Okay, so for specific types of incident results, you're going to have to tell us the duration of those. So if a student had in-school suspension for five days, you would report a duration of five days. If they additionally received out-of-school suspension for 10 days, you would report 10 days associated with that out-of-school suspension. Um, the incident duration or the incident result duration is not required for law enforcement referrals, school-related arrests, restraint, or seclusion, or other means of correction. It really is only required for in and out of school suspensions as well as expulsion. So if I could jump in, there was a question in the chat earlier uh, asking about would a police report be an incident result? And Brandy just mentioned uh, law enforcement referrals. It would fall into that specific code. Yes, that's correct. Thanks, Steve. Okay, and then the last field is the incident result modification code. So we do know um, this really is specific um, sometimes to expulsions. We expanded it um, to also be used with suspensions in some cases when students are put on behavioral contracts. But really, what we're collecting here um, is an indication, for example, if a student is recommended for expulsion, uh, but the board decides that they're going to put that student on a behavioral contact track and they're going to suspend the enforcement of the expulsion if the student abides by the terms of the contract. Okay, So in that case, you would report an incident result of expulsion, but in this field you would tell us that the enforcement was suspended. Okay. Um, additionally, if an expulsion period was shortened, that's another uh, modification code that's in this category. If a, a disciplinary action was not modified in any way, um, then there's another code in that in that code set that says this uh, there was no modification to this particular disciplinary action or incident result. Okay. The last file is the student offense file. So the student offense file uh, again is only submitted for students who committed statutory offenses. So you'll notice in all three of our other, or in, in the other two files, we have four people and two incidents listed. But you'll notice here that one of the students is gone. Okay, And that's because one of those students did not commit a statutory offense. Okay, They, they happened to have an incident that involved restraint or seclusion only. Therefore, that student would not be reported in the student offense file. Okay, Again, the um, incident ID is really key in this file. It's the last three fields on this particular file. Um, so that incident ID should be the same for that student on all three of these files. The student offense code. So this allows LEAs to identify the specific education code section in 48900 and 48915 that was violated. Okay. And again, it's whether or not the student was suspended or expelled. Could have been other means of correction as well. And then the last field is weapon category code. So if that statutory offense involved a firearm or a knife or any type of weapon, you would be asked to specify um, the weapon category code within this last field. Okay, so this is taking a look at the full submission. So again, the incident file, we've got two incidents reported involving a total of four students. Okay, remember, all four students are going to have results. 
in this case, all four students have one result record, okay? Um, if you look at the, the orange section, you look at the incident result code, you'll see that pseudo student 100, the incident result code is 100, which means that student was suspended out of school. Uh, phony pupil, they were received in-school suspension. Fake child, their incident result code is 300. That means other means of correction. And then faux youth, uh, 501, this is uh, seclusion, right? This student had an incident of uh, that resulted in just seclusion, which is incident result code 501. Okay, but you'll notice in the last file, which is the student offense file, that the very last record for faux youth Okay? We don't have a record for, for that student in the student offense file. And again, the primary reason is because it, they did not violate a section of ed code. So only students that violate sections of ed code would have, um, would have a need for the student offense file. Anything you wanted to add, Nate? Yeah, I just wanted to um, let everybody focus on the incident ID local. I think this uh, particular slide shows you the relationships and the importance of that field. Um, you're going to establish the incident and provide a unique incident ID, but you're going to tie these additional records from the SERS and the SOF to that ID. And so it's important that uh, more so than the student's name or anything else, that the incident ID is mapped appropriately because a student may have uh, multiple results to a single ID. In the same file, a student may be involved in multiple incidents. And so you would want to distinguish that with the incident ID. So I just wanted to hammer home the importance of tying these records together because you're not done with them. You're going to be sending them off to your LEA and they're going to have to be able to associate these students. It could cause uh, incorrect data or even worse. Uh, maybe that's the worst case scenario is it gets sent up to CalPads as incorrect, uh, but it can cause minor problems as far as even trying to submit it. And the reason why I say that's uh, Less of a scenario is that can be fixed and identified, but if it's incorrect and it gets accepted, uh, we have bad data in the system. Right. Um, so, so quick question about the temp, about the spreadsheet. Some people are asking, is the MPS required by CDE to complete these spreadsheets for the LEA? No, they're uh, not. No, uh, the, the intent is to provide you a vehicle. If you have a better method, that's fine. But well, we really want you to know that the information that's required with every incident, with every offense, with every result. And we just wanted to try to simplify it. That's uh, really the purpose of the spreadsheet. You do not have to use it. And uh, before Shiloh and Brandon go on, I just wanted to say that uh, if you Google CalPads user manual, uh, it'll come up. It's easily searchable. And then you go to help. That's where we keep the batch file templates. And as of right now, the discipline file hasn't been broken up. Uh, it will be uh, a, a little bit future on the other side of uh, the holiday season. Uh, conservative estimate is spring, but I'm sure it'll be available before that. Um, and so if you're collecting your data in the future, uh, just remember, go to the CalPads user manual, go to help, and look up the batch file templates. In that resources, page is a copy of the PowerPoint as well as a document that Nate was very kind to <clears throat> uh, put together for us. It's called the NPS Student Discipline Guide. Um, so because NPS schools are going to be required to submit these data, and it's really a smaller subset of data than all of the data that we collect in CalPads, we decided to put all of the information you needed to populate these spreadsheets in one place, in one location. Okay, so if you look at these tabs, You'll see that the first three tabs are replicas of those student incident, student incident result, and uh, excuse me, student offense files. And what he's also done is the second row provides you a definition of what each of these fields means. So the intent is that, that theoretically you could start populating at row three for all of your um, student offenses student incident results, and student incident information. Okay, so this is um, to give you an idea of what the batch templates would look like. Additionally, we've given you a list of all of the code sets that are required to populate all of these fields. So 
So um, we talked about, um, let's scroll over a little bit here. Um, let's talk about student offenses, for example. We told you that all of the student offenses align with specific education codes. So in this student offense tab, you'll see all of the different offenses for 48900 and 48915. Okay? There are a whole lot of them. Um, so what you have to do, and this is one of the biggest issues that we heard last year when we um, tried to bring NPS schools into the fold, uh, was, okay, you got to report discipline data. But many of you currently do not have systems where you align specific incidents and offenses that occur within there to these ed codes. And that's what's really important, is if a student commits one of these offenses, it has to be reported for IDEA and state purposes. Okay, so you have to start getting in the habit of uh, documenting all of the student incidents in NPS schools um, with these education code sections if, in fact, a student violated one of these education code sections. Okay, so you have to familiarize yourself um, with this particular code set. The other thing is we talked about student incident results. There's a tab, and you can see all of the particular results that a student could have. They could have out-of-school suspension as well as in-school suspension, and ultimately they might end up being expelled. So in that case, a student would have three incident results. Okay, um, You'll see that there's uh, other means of correction, no action, physical restraint, mechanical restraint, seclusion, and then school-related arrests and law enforcement referrals. Okay, So these can be Again, multiple incident results can be submitted for one student for one incident. Um, and then, of course, all of the other code sets, removal to interim alter alternative setting code, as well as here's the weapon categories and student incident results authority. Okay, so when you're populating the, uh, when you're populating the spreadsheets, this is your guide, okay? For each of those fields that requires a code, you would do a lookup. So if you wanted to know which code to use for incident results authority and it was a principal that or a, a director that ended up issuing a, a suspension, you would select code 10 and you would put that code value in the spreadsheet. Um, so the CalPads file specification Although we did try to create a, a document that combines it that's smaller, uh, the spouse specification would tell you the requirements. It provides a definition of the particular field element and uh, how to use it in the comments. So it, like statutory offense indicator um, at the top, we have it's an indication of whether the incident was involved one or more students committing a statutory offense. And then it refers you to the ed code. And so the value I find in supporting LEAs and data coordinators uh, is that it gives you a reference, right? And so we may or may not know what our statutory offense is, but we can get the official documentation. We could go to the ed, ed code, which has been uh, relayed to me by Shiloh and Brandy that this is actual law, and you could reference the definition as it is written. Um, and then it tells you exactly what to do. If yes, then a uh, student offense record and a student incident results record will be required. If no, uh, then only a results record is required. So the, your guide to populating uh, the data, even before you reference the code set, would be the CFS or the CFS fields we provided in, in the NPS document. Uh, the code set, right, or brand new, uh, so kindly went over the, how to use the codes, how to populate the data. Um, what I want to make sure you understand is the coded value in this uh, screenshot, we have 400, 501, 502, 600, 700. That is what you need to populate in whatever you're going to give your LA, whether it's the spreadsheet or something different. The LEA needs this code to submit the record in the CalPads. If it's not a defined code value, they're not going to be able to submit the, the, the incident or the results or the offense is going to give them a problem. And so you have to best determine what happened and map that information to the code set. Um, 
whatever happened in the incident, if, if, if it was no action or other means of correction, right? Did the student get a referral, which is in the suspension or expulsion? Would that be no action or other means of correction? You have to determine that right. using the code set definitions. Uh, the only the last thing is the only code values you won't find are if the CFS field ends with indicator, that's always a yes or no value. So just kind of clarifying the data that's sent up through these um, your spreadsheets or however you report them, the LEA will take that and they will submit that to CalPAT. So I think we already talked about that, but I just kind of want to reinforce it because we're getting a couple questions in the Q&A about it. And then somebody says there a code for elopement. I don't Wait, think it's a 48900 violation. So it is not. It's not. Yeah. So they're, if you're suspending a student because they're running away, they I mean, I don't know if that's like a self suspension. <laughs> um, sort of. So obviously they're missing education if they're leaving. Um, it'd be the same thing like if a student skips school, but that, that's not a 48900 violation. But um, the, sometimes the questions I would ask is why would you be associating either a restraint or a seclusion or a, um, a suspension or expulsion for that? Clearly, we, I mean, it's just that it wouldn't necessarily wouldn't be reportable unless they were having an, a, a restraint or a seclusion associated with it. Mm -hmm. But um, again, these are the same questions folks, sometimes folks ask me, oh, what do I do about suspension that occurs from incidents that happen in the residential facility? And my answer is, well, why are they experiencing school-related suspension because of something that happened <coughs> in the residential facility? Like my children um, last night got into a huge fight over the Xbox, and um, my response to them was not, you don't go to school tomorrow. My response to them was, you don't get the Xbox anymore. Um, and so, and then when my son was like, I don't want to go to school, or they skip school, um, obviously we want them to have consequences, but we also want to understand a little bit more about why they're feeling the need to run away or not be there. Um, so just that kind of thing, but that is, running away is not a 48900 violation, um, or 48915, so. Okay, so let's, let's cover some of the key reporting timelines. Um, so, one of the really important things to know is that you could be theoretically giving this information to your districts of residence right now, right? We're giving you the tools to be able to do that. And so, what we'd like you to do is get into the practice of sending this information over to your reporting or the districts of residence uh, on a regular basis. So, you, can, you should be doing that between July 1st. Um, and we're making a recommendation, you know, up to June 15th of 2020, right? So July 1st, 2019, all the way up to June 15th, 2020, you should be submitting these files to the LEAs on a regular basis, okay? Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to go up to CalPads yet, though, because the end-of-year submission window actually doesn't even open until May 11th. But what it does do is give the local educational agencies an opportunity to take that information and enter it into their student information systems so that it can be reported in a timely manner. If you wait as an NPS school until May or June to get this information over to your districts and you send them a whole bunch of data, it is going to be very problematic because it may result in errors, right? So what you don't see is that between that July 1 and June 15th window, um, there's a whole series of questions that, that the LEA may have for you because the data um, are not correct or they're resulting in some sort of uh, validation within the student information, error, error in the student information system. So they're going through all of these corrections even before they get the, the data up to CalPAD. It's really important that you start doing this as soon as possible and as often as possible. Minimally, you should be sending them a file once a month. Um, the end of your submission window opens on May 11th, which means that these files can start being submitted to CalPATS. Once again, NPS schools do not have direct access into CalPATS. They will not be submitting files. You must provide the information to the districts of residence, and they will report it up to CalPATS. Okay. Between May 11th um, and July 15th, again, they're resolving CalPAD's uh, input validation errors, meaning errors that they get when they try to enter the data into CalPAD. Um, and they're also trying to resolve certification 
validation errors. Um, so that occurs once they get the data into the system, and then it does comparisons with other files um, that may result in other errors that they have to resolve. Um, ideally, what needs to happen between May 11th and July 15th is that all of those errors need to be resolved so that the local educational agency, the district, can approve the data at an LEA level. Okay. So once that's done, however, um, the data have to go through a secondary review because um, there are specific reports for students with disabilities um, that the SELPA actually has to approve. Ultimately, SELPA has to be the one to have the final approval on all reports for students with disabilities. Their deadline is July 31st, um, and that is the initial certification deadline for our end of year three submission. Um, once they have that approval, there is the opportunity to make changes in an amendment window between August 1st and August 28th. There's about a four week period after that initial certification deadline where you can still change your data and then what gets finally certified is certified by both the LEA and the SELPA by August 28, 2020. That is the absolute deadline. So did we have any questions about reporting timeline? Okay. Okay. Um, not about dates. Somebody was asking, where can we get the seven-digit county district codes? Um, that should be listed on most of your co your contract paperwork, but if not, it's listed in the um, CDE uh, school database, public school database, cde.ca.gov. Um, so he said, and the input. Um, so somebody was asking, this has come up before as well. Um, the NPS submit incidents reports per the master contract for a number of student incidents that are not strictly offensive, which was related to discussion about elopement. Also, minimal property damage and student injury, they are required to report them. How do the LAs keep those separate from the data you're requiring here? Um, so, like, behavior emergency reports are different than, say, what we're requiring here. What we're requiring here is the data that's required to be submitted under both IDEA and state law to the department to complete its state and federal reporting requirements. You also have a, a requirement to report behavior emergency reports to the LEA, and that's for to track how well the student's doing the issues that might arise with the student. So they are, sometimes they're overlapping things, and sometimes they're different things. And so um, that that's the difference here. Right, and all of, all of the key components that we're requiring in this file would not be required for those behavioral emergency reports that Shiloh is referring to where there wasn't an ed code violation or didn't yeah. result in restraint or seclusion. So, I mean, uh, just knowing that the reportable offenses would get, be submitted to your LEA in this format, but the other non-statutory offenses or non-reportable offenses may be submitted in some type of other format. And then, um, can you just clarify what code 400 meant on the um, outcome? Sure. Uh, 400, oh, no action. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, first of all, please don't ever report that code because <laughs> if it's a statutory offense, um, ideally it's, it's suspendable or expellable, right? So telling the department that you took absolutely no action, which means you did absolutely nothing, um, it's not a good idea. So you may be questioning, like, well, then why did you put it in there? If you never want us to report it. Um, it's actually in there because it's a federal requirement. Um, they actually have a category for no action. Um, but we don't expect that it would be used very often. I mean, it literally, it means absolutely nothing was done. So there's a difference between other means of correction, and there are specific guidelines and statutes that, that help to define. It's not an, uh, an all-inclusive list, but it is a list of of things that are statutorily defined as other means of correction, okay? Um, other means of correction does not mean no action. No action means absolutely nothing was done. Good, that's all the questions we have right now. Okay. All right, so moving on. So some of the things that you have to consider um, now that we're giving you all of this information, we're giving you the tools to begin to start tracking the information. Um, some of the questions you need to answer and sit down with the team is, where is this information going to be tracked and how is it going to be tracked? Um, those of you that have formal student information systems, 
It may be that your student information system does not have places to put all of the information that you need to track here. So are there conversations that you have to have with the student information system vendor to make modifications? Okay. And if, if for whatever reason the student information system vendor uh, will not make modifications to the system, you have to come up with alternative methods. It may be that this information just gets tracked in a batch template or a spreadsheet very similar to what we're giving you today. But you have to make some of these decisions. Definitely, if you have a um, student formal student information system, even if it's a custom system, uh, you should have a conversation with those individuals. The other thing that we can do at the department um, is if you would be kind enough to type in the Q&A the names of your student information system vendors, the department can certainly reach out to these companies and provide them the specifications so that maybe they can build it in for you if it's not already there. Okay, um, But if you do have a formal student information system, if you would be so kind as to type it in the Q&A box, and we can um, follow up with some of these vendors and provide them some information. The other um, thing that you, questions that you want to answer is who is going to be responsible for tr identifying and tracking this information? Right? Who's going to be responsible for putting it in the spreadsheet or putting it in the student information system? Um, and then finally, who's going to be responsible for providing all of the needed information to local educational agencies on a regular and timely basis? And who's the most knowledgeable person to assist in the resolution of any errors that your uh, LEAs find in the data that you're providing? Um, some of you may be asking, well, who in the heck would I contact at the district about CalPAD? Um, so CSIS has actually put together a list of local educational agency contacts that are that are specific to the CalPAD system. So if you find want to find out who your LEA CalPAD administrator is, we have provided a link for you in the PowerPoint, um, and it will tell you the name, the email address, and the phone number of that person. Right, and so I just wanted to make sure uh, because we we've done this webinar. Uh, once before, we did a version of it last year, and I was lucky enough to assist Brandy and Shiloh with some of the special ed data population. And there's always a communication about what's my responsibility, who do I talk to, where do I get information. And right, and I just wanted to, you know, let you all know that you have a contract, and every district that you have a contract with has a CalPADS data coordinator. There's also a special ed data coordinator. Those two people will be able to provide answers to the 90% of the questions that you have. And there's no reason why there shouldn't be an open flow of communication where you can provide information and answer questions and they can do the same. So that's, it's very imperative that you guys uh, not just establish relationships, but foster uh, supportive relationships so that this information can go back and forth. Because although we do have a service desk and we try to be as helpful as possible, we're serving the entire state, right? And your LEA data coordinator, your special ed data coordinator, who you should already have a relationship with, can be a little bit more responsive. They know your individual student information. Uh, they're a tremendous resource, right? And so if you're at an MPS school and you have a lot of questions, some of the, they can be, they can be answered if you start with identifying the contacts at your, your districts that you have contracts with. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was the fact that, uh, you know, last year there was a lot of um, angst about the fact that, you know, we were going to be requiring uh, at that time discipline data from non-public, non-sectarian schools um, for the very first time in CalPAD last year. And um, one of the biggest things I heard from local educational agencies was, okay, so should I reach out to my NPS school? Should I... Um, reach out. Uh, so one of the reasons that we decided to conduct this training specifically for non-public, non-sectarian schools was because if we clearly communicate the requirements to you, it's going to really reduce the number of people that are making phone calls to you if you can provide the same set of information to every single district whose students you serve. Right? So you can put it all in one place, and then when the districts ask for it, you can take their subset of data and just send it to them, rather than having different points of communication with lots of different people um, 
And oftentimes, you know, you guys were very, very confused about what each of those individuals was asking. So we're trying to streamline all of this for you um, to tell you exactly what they're going to need so that you can provide it back to them. So here are some additional resources. So the CalPATH systems documentation page, which is the top link, is going to give you um, the file specifications document that Nate referenced, um, as well as uh, the full CalPATH code sets. So we gave you the code sets related to all of the incident reporting, um, but there are lots of other code sets uh, that we collect information on. So all of that information can be found on the systems documentation page. Um, the other thing that you can find on the systems documentation page is a link to our communications. And in uh, the CalPATH flash, also you'll see up here, um, you can't really see it in this screen, but um, listserv information. So local educational agencies can sign up for the CalPATH listserv and they can automatically receive those flashes. So if you are interested in signing up for that listserv, you are more than welcome to do so. And you can get all of the CalPATH communication which now includes um, much of the information that we're sending out for students with disabilities as well. Um, the documentation at CalPATH.org, the, the reference documents, is this the mapping guides, Nate? Yes. Okay. So the CalPATH mapping guides um, actually will show you for, for every single report, not necessarily that non-public schools will have access to this, but for every report in CalPATH, it actually gives you a guide to what each of the pieces of information in that report means, and that can be found at that link. And then obviously the, the final link is the csus.mac.org resources link. That's actually where you can find a copy of this presentation, as well as the um, MPS data, student data guide that Nate so graciously put together for you, that spreadsheet um, that we showed you today to help you start doing your uh, population of all of the student incident data. Okay. Um, and then there are a variety of ways uh, that you can get support. Obviously what we would expect, again, is if you're having an issue, we would like you to um, let your CalPADS administrator for the District of Residence send up a ticket to CalPADS. And they would do that through the CalPADS hyphen support uh, at cde.ca.gov email that will generate a help ticket. Um, you can call, but uh, what ends up happening is someone will basically transcribe that phone call into a ticket. So um, easiest way would be to have a ticket submitted. And then I, we already told you about signing up for one of the LEA listservs. You are more than welcome to do that. The help menu in CalPATH, which is a top link, um, also I failed to, menu, uh, to mention. So um, that page gives you lots of really useful information about the CalPATH system, although NPS schools will have very little action, little, little interaction with the actual CalPATH system. Okay, do we have any more questions? No question? Uh, let me make sure. I didn't see any pop up. Uh, okay, a couple here. Um, for the incident ID local code, is this an individual student for individual for individual student or for all students? So the incident ID local is for an incident. Okay. So the example, let me, let me go back to my example here. Um, so you'll see up here at the very, very top. Okay. An incident is an event on a specific date. Okay. So in this case, the incident ID is 2019-001, and it occurred on 7-1-2019. And this particular incident involved pseudo-student and phony pupil. Okay. These were the two students involved in this one incident. So an incident can have more than one student, but it gets the same incident ID and the same occurrence date, okay? Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. The other thing that to, to remember is uh, this is just a proposed numbering scheme or a way to develop a unique identifier. You may have um, another way 
to do that within your local educational agency. <clears throat> this is just a suggestion. Oftentimes, if you're entering information into a database system, uh, a lot of those database systems will assign auto numbers. And so that auto number um, would become your incident ID, for example. Um, somebody was asking about the SNIC, SIRS, SOFS templates. Are they ready for them to review? Are they available now? So the, the, the batch templates that would normally be available in the help menu in CalPads are not available yet. Uh, those will not be available till the spring. However, that's one of the reasons that we put together that spreadsheet for you, because it does actually put sort of a template together for you so that you can start tracking all of those. So yes, that is available in the um, ccs.ficmat.org slash resources page. Um, and a lot of people putting in what their um, SIS is, so thank you for those. Um, any final questions that people want to put into the Q&A? Uh, where do you find out the reporting LEA um, number? So the reporting LEA for students who are at a non-public school would be the LEA that placed the child at your non-public school, and you would find that code on the CDS database. So um, I could can... ask the district representative themselves as well. Yeah, they also know it too. <laughs> it's probably on all your documentation. It's the code that you've used if you've reported that student for um, case missed purposes or if you provided information or on case missed purposes to the LEA. It's the code you've used to identify the LEA in the past. Um, so, so if you go to the CDE's website and you type in public school directory into our search box here at the top, it will tell you, take you to the California school directory. Okay, they've revised this and it's really cool because all you have to do is enter, let's say, the name of the district. So let's just say um, I'm looking for Sacramento Unified School District. You just hit the search button. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna show me Sacramento City Unified. It's a unified school district. And here is the CDS code, three, four, six, seven, four, three, nine. Okay, you'll notice that there are seven zeros appended at the end. Uh, anytime you see seven zeros appended at the end, that means this is a district, right? Um, and so the district code that you would be reporting are the first seven digits, that three, four, six, seven, four, three, nine. That is a really easy way to find the reporting LEA county district code. So um, because of uh, accessibility requirements, we very likely cannot post it on the CDE's website. So, um, but, but I believe in some instances we actually get uh, CSIS to, to post it on their resources site. So um, we can have a conversation about that. Yes, we will. We'll do our best. Um, we did have the materials, so all the materials are there. Right. And we're working on an FAQ document based on the, the webinars that we have had around this issue. So we, um, we will be working on that and hopefully be getting that out um, after the first of the year. I hope. You know, we just have this whole like CalPad certification thing, that little tiny thing. <laughs>